Hello, everyone. Welcome to Grok Spotlight. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Mariah Larwood. I'm a content manager here at Grok, and I will be your MC. Uh, today's presenters, we have Andrew Ling, PhD, Senior Director of Software Engineering and ML Compilers here at Grok, and Andrew Batar, Compiler Tech Lead and Manager here at Grok. Now, if you haven't met Grok before, we are an AI accelerator and ML systems innovator. Today, we're here to share more about Grok Compiler, a key component of our technology stack that really enables our software-defined hardware approach. After today's presentation, we look forward to answering any questions you might have during our Q&A with presenter Andrew Ling. So with that, we'll dive into today's, today's presentation. Hi, my name's Andrew Ling. I'm a senior director here at Grok, and I lead the ML compilers and software team. Today, I'll be talking to you about Grok's journey specifically related to software. Software really has been the focus since the beginning here at Grok. What I'm showing you here is an original slide that Jonathan Ross, our founder and CEO, presented, highlighting his vision of where Grok would be. And software has always been a focus of this. In fact, Jonathan invested and built the software flow and the compiler before he developed the hardware. To understand the advantage of this, you really need to compare it to conventional approaches. In conventional approaches, you will start with the silicon, not the software, and that yields complexity, both at the software level and hardware. And this is because of many reasons, some of which are shown here. With this approach, oftentimes what you end up with is unpredictable hardware, unpredictable data movement, lack of visibility of the hardware to the software, and difficulty in parallelization within the software. All of which yields complexity and difficulty in software development. How we've solved this as an industry is by patching it up with humans. Effectively, we've put humans in the loop in the compilation flow using kernels. Kernels being effectively hand-scheduled programs that are mapping operations onto silicon. Although this seems to work, this leads to significant complexity upstream for developers, where we are seeing an explosion of custom kernels inject themselves into developer frameworks. Here, I'm showing you the growth of the number of kernel ops within the PyTorch framework. These kernel ops are not actually adding any functionality to the framework, but are implementation details that are being exposed to the developer. For example, there are almost 70 different convolutional operators that PyTorch users can choose from. Many of these are identical to each other in terms of functionality. The danger of this is that it slows development for developers and creates friction points when you want to update your model. Additionally, this creates business risk since you are tying your workload to a specific vendor medium, making it more difficult to migrate your solution to other platforms and locking you in. At Grok, we effectively avoid this, where we take a kernel-less approach to compilation. Here, we're basically showing the overall Grok compilation flow on the left-hand side, where we take a high-level TensorFlow or PyTorch model, perform front-end optimization onto that model, layout, mark, and optimize the buffers within that model, perform declarative rewrites, which takes that high-level model and then decomposes it down to simpler operators that are much more amenable to what's run on the hardware, perform graph optimizations on that, and then finally schedule the graph. Additionally, at Grok, we've enabled an extremely effective way to simplify the front end of our flow by decomposing the thousands of different PyTorch operators that exist out there into a small subset of canonical operators for full functionality. By taking this approach, we've effectively simplified the problem and reduced the solution space to a much more tractable set. This tractable set is called Grok's G10 op library. And by only needing to support tens of operators 
versus thousands, we have a much simpler development flow within our compiler and a much quicker way to enable new models within Grok. Additionally, by taking a software-first mindset, we've enabled an extremely simple architecture shown here. Here, we're basically showing you the handful of operators that exist within our architecture. This includes a memory unit, a vector unit, or VXM, a matrix unit, or MXM, and a switching or data layout unit, or SXM. A Grok architecture is really just a linear combination of these core operators or functional units. Within each functional unit, there is only a handful of instructions that we need to support. Both of these factors, the limited number of functional units that we need to support and the small number of instructions that exist within each functional unit, both contribute to an extremely simple and fast way to implement a vectorizing compiler here at Grok. The impact of this is extremely fast development and velocity to enable new models and functionality. This was seen in the past year, where we've seen an exponentially large number of models that we've been able to support over time. Starting from late 2021, where we are only able to support a handful of toy models, all the way to now, where we're able to support tens of models in late 2022, with a huge diversity from transformers, MLPs, CNNs, LSTNs, and beyond. Over time, this trend only accelerated, where in the next quarter, we're actually able to increase the number of models that we supported by almost an order of magnitude, where within 45 days, we were able to go from 60 models that we supported to more than 500. And again, this is all enabled because of Grok's simplicity in how we develop the software and focus on software to create simple hardware. In addition to functionality, Grok enables performance, where we have significantly sped up the applications of many customer workloads by over 10x in many cases. These include applications such as COVID drug discovery, FFTs, and other applications that our customers care about. With that, I thank you for spending the time with me to talk about Grok's software journey. For further questions, please reach out to us during our online Q&A. I encourage you to stay for our successive sections where my colleague Andrew Batar will be discussing how Grok represents hardware within our software flows to enable another dimension of flexibility for architecture exploration. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Today, I'll be presenting Grok's software-defined hardware for Dataflow Compute. My name is Andrew Batar. I'm a technical lead and manager on the compiler team at Grok. The foundational building block of the Grok architecture is the SIMD functional unit. This functional unit supports a set of vector operations and is supported by a very lightweight instruction dispatch unit. You can think of this as the base class of the architecture, if you will. And what we do with this base class is we specialize it into various different types, with each type supporting its own set of operations for the architecture. We have the MXM for matrix vector operations, VXM for vector vector operations, the SXM for data reshape operations, and finally the memory unit for a very high bandwidth on-chip memory. And so what we do with these different functional unit types is we step out multiple copies across the horizontal dimension with more copies of a given functional unit type providing more concurrency for the operations that the, that functional unit type supports. And bringing back our instruction dispatch units, each of these functional units have their own instruction dispatch unit. However, they execute all in lockstep, providing a common time domain across the different functional units. And finally, we'd like efficient communication between these functional units, so we introduce these high bandwidth stream registers for data passing. This has described the foundational structure of the Grok architecture. Now I'd like to get into how this empowers our compiler. The Grok Tensor Streaming Processor architecture exhibits four characteristics that provide predictable compute that empowers our compiler. The first is software-controlled memory, meaning absolutely no hardware caching. The second is lockstep execution of our functional units. The third is a very simple on-chip interconnect. And finally, the Grok architecture provides a synchronous multi-chip execution paradigm. Let's go into these into a little bit more detail. 
The Gronk architecture provides software-controlled memory with absolutely no dynamic hardware caching. This empowers the compiler to be fully aware of the physical location of all pieces of data throughout the execution of the program. This means there's no memory hierarchy here. There's no L1, L2, L3. The compiler is empowered to physically address the physical banks that are instantiated on the chip. Now, not only does this empower a compiler, it also provides very high memory bandwidth, which allows the architecture to achieve very high compute efficiencies, even for workloads that have very low operational intensities. The functional units on the chip execute in lockstep, which empowers the compiler to perform cycle accurate instruction scheduling. So you could think of this as synchronous execution of our threads, with each of the instruction dispatch units across, across the chip issuing exactly one instruction for every cycle of execution, giving all the functional units across the chip a common time domain. Now, not only does this empower our compiler, it is also very uh, cheap to implement in hardware. The instruction dispatch units on the chip consume less than 3% of the silicon area on the chip, maximizing the amount of area dedicated for raw compute and memory. Now, for efficient communication between the different functional units on the chip, the architecture intentionally employs a very simple one-dimensional interconnect, which consists of two paths, an eastward path and a westward path, where each of these paths of communications consist of an array of stream registers, where each of these stream registers are in effect a single cycle hop along the path. Now you'll notice that there are no reactive hardware components here. There are no arbiters or queues, which empowers the compiler to very easily reason about data movement throughout the execution of, a, of the program without needing to perform any type of expensive cycle accurate simulation. In fact, for the compiler to reason about the travel time between two functional units, is as simple as doing a simple add or subtract operation by looking up the number of hops between those different functional units. Now we've talked about how the architecture provides predictability within the context of a single TSP, but the architecture also extends this notion of predictability to a system of TSPs, which is enabled by Grok's uh, synchronous chip-to-chip -chip communication protocol. This C2C protocol implements a plesiochronous communication system which accounts for any natural clock drift that occurs across the TSPs in the overall network. Now, additionally, the network of TSPs does not have any dedicated router chips. In fact, the TSP acts as both processor and router, which means that the compiler is empowered as part of the programs that it generates to not only schedule compute, but schedule all network traffic. So this means that the compiler is aware of the exact cycle that data needs to be sent from a source TSP and the exact cycle will arrive at a destination TSP, allowing the compiler to make globally optimal load balancing decisions of all network traffic throughout the execution of the program. Putting this all together, the Grok compiler is given full power of data orchestration. And this is really illustrated here with a example program that was generated by the Grok compiler and visualized using the Grok view tool that is available as part of our SDK. This really illustrates and visualizes the exact behavior of the hardware on a cycle by cycle basis. The exact addresses that will be written, written to and read from, the exact functional units that are be, being executed and what instructions are being executed. Now, I'd like to be clear that this is all done without ever having to run on any target hardware, nor performing any type of expensive hardware simulation. The Grok view tool is simply naively taking the information provided by the compiler and visualizing it here. So for example, you could freeze this at cycle 1000, and without needing to replay all the 999 cycles that happened in prior, you'll be able to visualize the exact information that the compiler has, the exact instructions that are being executed and the exact locations of every piece of data at that specific cycle. And this is all thanks to the software-defined hardware, the sheer control that has been given to the compiler by the architecture. The Grok compiler has reached a significant level of maturity over the past year, which has led to an exponential growth in the number of programs that we support out of the box. And this includes programs that we pull directly from public repositories, such as Hugging Face, and we take the PyTorch and TensorFlow code natively without needing to make any changes, ingest it directly in the Grok compiler, in which, and it subsequently is able to produce programs that run directly on our chip. Now, I'd like to emphasize that this is all done without developing dedicated kernel libraries for these different classes of applications. Whether the program or workload comes from a computer, the domains of computer vision or natural language processing or HPC, each of these programs go through the exact same compiler stack, the exact same lowering steps 
producing a program that efficiently uses the Grok hardware. This really illustrates the generality of Grok's compilation approach. Now, the predictable nature of the Grok architecture also empowers the compiler to be able to predict the exact performance of a given benchmark that it compiles, down to the cycle. And it's able to do this without having access to any hardware or doing any type of hardware simulation. Because the compiler has cycle-by-cycle -cycle control over the underlying hardware, it's able to predict the exact performance of a given benchmark that it compiles. And we use this superpower to be able to develop a hardware software co-design flow where we can use the compiler to evaluate different permutations of the architecture, changing, for example, the distribution of functional units that we may consider building, and seeing how that impacts the performance of a given benchmark suite. Now, not only can we optimize the Grok architecture for a given benchmarks, we can also optimize the benchmarks for a given Grok hardware without ever needing to, again, have access to the hardware or any kind of expensive simulation. And this allows us to develop a very powerful hardware software co-optimization flow co-optimizing both architecture and application. To summarize, in this era of data flow compute, computer architects have really been presented with a new opportunity to take a step back and think from first principles how best to develop a compute platform for this new class of workloads. Now, the spatial architectures that are employed by many different domain-specific architectures are a good start, but at Grok, we believe that predictability is needed to empower our software. We need software-defined hardware and developing the Grok compiler targeting our predictable Grok architecture, we've been able to develop an automated parallelizing compiler. And not only does this compiler able to support a general flow for parallelizing workloads across a set of applications, we also leverage the Grok compiler to develop a very powerful hardware software co-design flow to create an overall optimal solution for a given problem. Thank you very much, and please reach out if you have any questions. Alrighty, thank you so much, Andrew, for presenting our colleague, Andrew Pitar, who couldn't be here today. Um, I wanted to dive into some our live Q&A portion. Uh, just a notice for the audience, we will work to get to all of your questions, but in the chance that we don't have time, uh, we will follow up with you afterwards. So with that, it looks like we have a few coming in here. Um, alrighty, so first one, um, it looks like uh, you've been working on compilers for a while, Andrew. How has your experience differed in working on Grok compiler compared to what you've worked on in the past? Yeah, I mean, uh, Andrew Batar and myself both touched on this in the presentations, but I think fundamentally the the thing that really sticks out is this kernelist theme. Um, you know, we're, we're effectively building a automated vectorizing compiler, and that is relatively unique. You know, I think it's, it's not much of a secret that pretty much all the incumbents have to rely on kernels to get good performance. And here we're defining kernels as effectively, you know, assembly level programming wrapped up in either templates or libraries and things like that. And I think they're doing a very good job on this front, quite frankly. You know, they have the capital to push on that strategy, you know, they have armies of engineers. I know there's some automation approaches behind that to generate some of these templates automatically, but ultimately uh, it is still a relatively manual process. And additionally, as you move from device to device, there's this huge, you know, Herculean effort to actually migrate those kernels to the next generation devices. You know, the benefit of Grok is we have this automated approach. So A, device migration is much quicker, and B, in terms of our internal development, it's a much more efficient effort where, you know, we are a startup. So we have to be very mindful about our capital costs. So the team is relatively small, but we're able to make this progress that Andrew and uh, myself showed in the previous slides where, you know, we had this explosion of functionality in terms of the number of models we supported. I think that's only possible because we have this automated approach. If we relied on the kernel based approach, we either needed, you know, either an order of magnitude more uh, funding to get there, or it would have taken us, you know, uh, you know, several years to actually get to that journey. Absolutely. Uh, this is a pretty great follow-up question. Um, 
how does a developer operate when you say kernel lists or that Grok doesn't have kernels? Yeah, I mean, it becomes essentially, you know, the developer shouldn't be aware at the end of the day. And what you're seeing today is actually an exposure of this to the end developer, right? So when, you, when I say we don't have kernels, like the Grok compiler is literally mapping directly to those functional units and the ISA within those functional units during the compilation process. At the end of the day, the developer really doesn't care how this is done. You know, assembly programming, kernels or kernel not kernels, who cares? As long as they can get their application onto the device, they're happy. I think the problem is because folks are taking this kernel-based approach, that hardware uh, complexity is actually being exposed directly to the developer and the end application. And there's proof of this. So if you take a look at the PyTorch ecosystem, it has thousands of ops. And I touched on that uh, in my talk. Like you are literally exposing the implementation details of convolutions to the end user. Additionally, it has these sort of permutations or variables of these fused ops. And it becomes intractable, like how to keep track, which op to actually use. Some ops are better performing than others. So um, it's, it's quite burdensome as an end user to have to deal with all of this. And the fact that we avoid all this, it really simplifies things at the front end such that the developer really doesn't have to care about it. Fantastic. Uh, next question. I read a lot of stuff on your website, and you mentioned developer velocity or reducing developer complexity. So how does your tech actually change my frustrations? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I touched on it in the last question, but at the end of the day, if, if you have to care about the implementation details of what device you're actually mapping to, that slows you down. Uh, both in many ways. A, you have to really think about what ops matter. And then secondly, when you're changing your model in terms of functionality, you're kind of stuck in this loop where you're iterating between functionality and then performance tanks, and then you have to go pick a new set of ops to make sure that whatever you used prior uh, to get the model to converge works. So it's this really arduous iteration loop that you get put on. Um, Again, because Grok, we don't really care about this and we avoid the whole issue, uh, changing your model becomes much more seamless. And additionally, I think the dream is that you can change even platforms eventually in a very seamless way. So as you move from generation to generation within Grok, uh, your application should not change. Uh, and I don't think this is generally true in the industry where if you move from one generation of the device to the next one, there is this sort of a migration pad that you have to do to your end models to actually get that working well. Great. Uh, all righty, next question. Um, Grok talks a lot about predictability um, in your guys' architecture. What value does this create for the end user? Yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, what the end user cares about, it's just results, right? So I think Andrew touched on this where because we have a predictable and deterministic architecture, whatever you compile, that is the exact to the cycle performance that you'll actually achieve uh, with your application. And having that, it's almost like you have this Oracle and you don't have to go through the secondary step of actually running your models and then empirically figuring out what's going to happen to your performance. So from that perspective, you know, there's less iterations that you have to do to actually deploy these things. Um, I think there's a broader impact of having this determinism and predictability because we can actually start developing the software before the hardware exists. We can actually flip the script in the sense that if you look at the industry, the vast majority of compilers are actually developed uh, after the fact, you know, after you get the silicon. And I think uh, you know, some of the hyperscalers, they've actually publicly published articles about this where you know, most of the compiler development will happen post tape out. And even, you know, once you get the uh, chip back in house, that's not the case with Grok. This almost empowers you and it flips the script where we're developing the software first. 
we have essentially the exact performance that we should be able to achieve with these devices that may not actually exist today. And that really empowers you know, business leaders um, and in the industry to really rethink uh, how they develop silicon. Sounds like a game changer. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. We've got one here um, about what's trending most uh, out there in the AI world. How do you perform on ChatGPT4? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I, you know, I think the question is really alluding to the fact that, like, how do you perform on some of these large language models? You know, maybe not specifically on ChatGPT. Um, so I think the overall answer is, uh, we have been able to run these large language models on our devices. I think the most recent was the Llama model that was published by Meta, uh, where it really took on the order of you know less than a few days to actually bring this up after they announced it. So, you know, that's aligned with the sort of narrative that we gave in our talks about how quickly it is uh, for us to actually bring up these new models. In terms of how we actually perform, it's relatively competitive. Um, so we've actually seen cases where we're getting several fold uh, better performance than the incumbents. Uh, but the devil's in the details. I mean, it really depends on the size of the models, um, how many chips we're using, and so on. So I think that's another thing that's actually quite interesting about uh, what we're doing in terms of how we're able to scale up and down in terms of number of chips. Um, and the trade-off is really performance. So if you actually want to run your model, on just a handful of chips, you can. But that trades off performance where obviously you have less compute with that, so it takes longer to run the model. Uh, if you have the desire and the, you know, the ability to actually scale that up to thousands of chips, we can do that as well. Uh, and the trade off is your latency should drop significantly because of that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of details there. Overall, we're pretty happy at where we are in terms of our ability to run large language models. But obviously, this is an evolving space. So I'm sure there'll be more innovations in the industry. And we're happy to, to adapt those changes uh, with our flow. Fantastic. Well, we're coming up on time here. But if um, you were to summarize just the key takeaways you hope people remember about us at Grok, what would, what would those be? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. I mean, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is reduce the frustration of our developers. Mm -hmm. You know, because we have this automated flow and kernelless compiler and predictable nature in terms of what we actually emit, a lot of the, you know, complexity and question marks that come out when you're developing new models and workloads goes away. So ultimately, I think that is really kind of the spirit that we're trying to push and that Jonathan really has been pushing since day one of Grok. Absolutely. Well, great. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, I do want to share a quick uh, uh, promo about another event that we have coming up. Um, it's going to be, if you're eager to learn more, you can join us for our next virtual event, Grok Day. Registration is open for the April 12th event, and we really hope to see you there in two weeks. You can save your spot by going to grok.link slash grokday4. And with that, we would like to just say if you have any questions, please follow up with us. Um, we'd love to speak with you. Um, we can set you up with one of our solution specialists. You can reach out to us at contact at grok.com. And with that, uh, thank you so much for joining, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs>